Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Today on the AMFP Podcast... We talk about deliberate practice because when we practice, we rehearse a behavior or action repeatedly in order to master it. Whether it's a sport, an art, a creative endeavor, everybody has certain practice skills they need to master in order to develop expertise. This is no different in our world of systemic therapy. So the question is, how do we need to practice in order to become an expert? We think about psychotherapy. We think of things like analyzing our sessions, videotaping our work, getting feedback from experts, both colleagues, supervisors, practicing things that happen specifically when you're working with couples and families. Deliberate practice, while very helpful, while in a training program, can also be useful to you if you're expanding your skill set to do more work in systemic individual couple or family therapy. So we're going to talk about the deliberate practice movement in psychotherapy with one of its innovators, Tony Ruminier, and another great MFT, Dr. Ryan Seedall. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Tony Ruminier is the executive director of the Sentio Counseling Center. His research focuses on quality improvement and measurement-based care and mental health training and service delivery. Tony is the incoming president of the APA's Division 29, that's the Society for the Advancement of Psychotherapy. He was awarded an Early Career Award by Division 29. He is the co-author of over a dozen books on psychotherapy training and clinical training around deliberate practice, including The Essentials of Deliberate Practice, Advanced Therapeutics, Clinical and Interpersonal Skills, and the recently released Deliberate Practice in Systemic Family Therapy, which we will talk about today. Previous to taking a position at Sentio, Dr. Ruminier was the Associate Director of Counseling and Director of Training at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Student Health and Counseling Association. Tony supports the open data movement and publishes his aggregated clinical outcome data in de-identified form on his website, drtonyr.com. Dr. Ryan Seedall is a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Utah. He graduated with his PhD in human development and family studies from Michigan State. At the Sorensen Center, Ryan provides MFT-related supervision to both master's and PhD students. He also serves as the associate director of the MFT program. Ryan employs a systemic perspective when working with individuals, couples, and families. He believes strongly that humans are wired for connection. The relationships can be crucial mechanisms of bringing about change. Ryan believes strongly in feedback-informed treatment, as we'll talk about today, and the importance of collaborating with both clients and therapists in training to ensure they achieve their therapy goals. I really enjoyed talking to these two gentlemen. I hope you will enjoy listening as well, and we will be back at the conclusion of the interview. Are progress notes stressing you out? Good documentation is essential for a high standard of care, but the time and effort involved can feel overwhelming. If you've experienced that overwhelm, Chronicler can help. Chronicler's intuitive note builder lets you compose excellent progress notes right in your browser, often in three minutes or less. Sign up today for a two-week free trial at TherapyShelf.com. That's TherapyShelf.com and see how easy high-quality progress notes can be. 
Eli, happy to be joined by Tony and Ryan on the AAMFT podcast. Gentlemen, this topic today, deliberate practice right up my alley and the alley of many of our listeners. So we're going to talk about exactly what that means and how both young systemic therapists, i.e. in a training program, or those that have been out a while, how they can integrate some of these principles. And we'll talk about some great resources, including the series of deliberate practice books, including the latest one released in late 2022, all around systemic family therapy. So first, gentlemen, let's orient our listeners meant by the term deliberate practice, if you've never heard about it before. Sure. I can start. Deliberate practice in a nutshell is just trying to get better at something. In this instance, it's getting better at therapy and it's not doing it in a haphazard way. Sometimes the way we practice and we hope for the best, but deliberate practice is a pretty focused, purposeful and systematic way of going about practice in order to get better. Eli, I would guess that most of the listeners have actually engaged in deliberate practice, even though they may not have thought of it as such. Anyone who's learned a musical instrument or a sport or how to play chess well or fly a plane or most skills, the process of learning them involves engaging in repeated skill rehearsal while getting feedback from a coach, and that's deliver practice. You're a historian on this, Tony, and really one of the innovators responsible to bring it to psychotherapy, not specifically systemic therapy, but where would people associate with deliberate practice with outside of psychotherapy and mental health? So something I ask when I run a workshop, I usually ask the audience, raise your hand if you ever played a sport growing up. Or raise your hand if you ever learned a musical instrument growing up. And most people raise one or both hands. And then I'd say, imagine you wanted to, you thought you're really good at your sport. Let's say you played soccer or let's say you learned to play the piano. You thought you were really good at it and you wanted to play professionally. Now imagine becoming a professional soccer player, a professional pianist without ever practicing. And usually people start snickering because it's unthinkable. Professionals usually spend way more time practicing than they do actually performing or competing. And we've gotten into a situation in psychotherapy where it's the opposite, where in therapy training, there's typically very little deliberate practice reversal, but instead a focus on academics and then supervised performance. When you put it that way, Makes complete sense. Who would put somebody into a game situation without practicing first? But that's exactly what we do in psychotherapy training. And in fact, sometimes we tell our young therapist in training to fake it till you make it. And that's certainly not how other disciplines do it. I am curious, your own journey, because we like to hear a lot about our experts. Tony, you are more associated with just general psychotherapy non-systemic kind of couple and family therapy. And Ryan, you, your lineage is very much like mine, rooted deeply in systemic thinkers with great mentors. So I'm curious of your own journey into psychotherapy and specifically deliberate practice. Yeah. I Actually, one of my favorite courses in graduate school was a narrative therapy class. And it was taught by a systemic uh, therapist who was my supervisor. And she provided some of the little deliberate practice that I got in graduate school, which is through a reflecting team where a team of, she and a team of students would watch me do real therapy, live therapy through a one-way mirror, and then phone in advice that I would pick up the phone and be super nervous and hear the advice and then try to perform it and then I'd get feedback from them. So the little bit of deliberate practice I did get was from a systemic therapy context, which is actually interesting. I think systemic therapy training has a kind of a culture and a tradition of being at the cutting edge of mental health. Yeah, for me, I got my master's degree and then I actually worked in community mental health for a couple of years. And while I really enjoyed it, it was difficult because my supervision was all case note supervision, case consultation. And so I remember, uh, I, after a couple of years, I 
ended up going on for my PhD, but I remember just feeling a little bit in a rut. Felt like I had a good relationship with my clients. Didn't feel like I was doing bad work, but I wasn't sure I was getting better. And the things that are designed in the therapy fields to, to I guess, quote unquote, get better are like education, just experience, things of that nature. A lot of times supervision and supervision can be wonderful, but again, mine was only case note, case consultation. And so I just felt in that rut and felt like I needed something more. And so going to a PhD program with observation, with feedback, that was a, a really great start. And then just reading, I believe it was the cycle of excellence that really opened it up for me and hearing from other scholars, just this idea of, Hey, we really should be very conscientious in how we try and get better at the therapy craft. And so it's been a fascination of mine since then. So let's take something abstract and make it more concrete. So when we talk about these deliberate practice skills within the domain of systemic therapy, what are we talking about? Give some specific examples of deliberate practice skills and things that any systemic therapist, both young or old, would want to work on to get up to mastery level. That's what's interesting. So this book that recently came out that I did with Adrian Blow and Deb Miller, that was our first question was, okay, what skills do we want to do? And it was fascinating to talk with them and trying to think about what skills can be practiced because I think we're decent in training programs of doing role plays, but they're big, they're broad, they're at the bird's eye level. And this was an opportunity to really hone in on specific therapy skills and really think about how can, what, what skills can students or clinicians or whoever practice so that they can get better. And so I know in our book, we have a couple skills about alliance, building the bonds, reframing, de-escalation is a huge one. I know, especially for beginning therapists to try on because they oftentimes don't feel very adequate in de-escalating. We had some on engendering hope, attention to diversity. Tracking the interactional cycle, I think, is one that I think is really fascinating. And we have a small skill related to initiating enactments, but I think a whole book could be written about initiating and facilitating enactments and doing it from a deliberate practice perspective. This is right up my alley as far as I've dedicated the last two decades of my career to studying these common factors and, and operationalizing them into training concepts. So the things you're mentioning right there, alliance, reframing, creating an enactment, they don't fit one specific model. They are generic to all forms of good relational therapy. So I am curious. So those are the skills and a lot of ways that we train therapists that are specific to MFT. Tony mentioned a reflecting team. I'm also thinking about inherent to our profession with, if you come from a different discipline, you may not know this or it may seem foreign, but videotaping your work is one of the gold standards of MFT and how we get feedback on our work. So how in a deliberate practice setting does videotape work? And then I'm curious, Tony, your thoughts on somebody is not a student, but is trying to learn a new skill because usually we don't tape our work past graduate school or past when we become independently licensed. So a question for both of you of how videotape works in deliberate practice. Sure. I mean, I'm the executive director of the Sentio Counseling Center, which is a practicum training site in California, where we have T trainees who are providing therapy to clients and all sessions are videotaped automatically. And those videos are used in deliberate practice supervision. So what will happen is, and we train our supervisors to do this. We have a deliberate practice supervision residency that we meet weekly with the supervisors to coach them through how to provide this kind of deliberate practice supervision. 
which is video-based supervision, where what happens is the supervisor and the trainee together will collaboratively determine a clinical skill focus. So this is a skill that is just beyond the trainee's ability, but it's called the zone of proximal development is the term for that. And it would be a skill that will be helpful with the current client and ideally is based on a section of the video where the supervisor and the trainee can see, okay, therapy maybe isn't going as well as it could in this section of the video. What is a therapy skill that could help the trainee? Now, it might be one of the skills from this book, or it might be a skill that the supervisor comes up with on the moment, describes and kind of improvises in the moment. And then the supervisor will guide the trainee through deliberate practice rehearsal using the video. So the supervisor might rewind the video to a point where the client says something that the, the trainee found to be challenging. And the trainee can practice responding to the video. And then the supervisor will give feedback and then they rewind the tape and they do it again. And they get more feedback and they rewind the tape and they do it again. And so on and so forth. And we try to arrange it so that each trainee gets at least 25 minutes of deliberate practice skill rehearsal per supervision session. Now, this is very different than traditional supervision where you spend a lot of time talking about skills, but you don't actually spend time rehearsing them, which is spending soccer practice talking about soccer or spending your piano practice talking about piano, but without rehearsal. We found that the rehearsal, and there is research to support this, the rehearsal is actually the most valuable part of the supervision. We have a saying we, we teach our supervisors, which is that the supervisor isn't actually doing the training. The rehearsal is doing the training. It's the supervisor's job to support, facilitate, and guide the rehearsal. Ryan, I'd love your thoughts on how you think what Tony just described. It seems it fits so nicely with how MFT supervision historically has been done, but even a more kind of targeted focus on certain skills and how to get feedback. So I'm curious how you think this fits in an already rich MFT framework of videotape supervision. Yeah. Supervision from a video standpoint is really crucial for training, for everything, being able to watch yourself, be able to understand. And I think historically, either the trainee watches themselves and then they're to themselves to identify specific things that may or may not be relevant. And then sometimes they will bring something to supervision and then it will be talked about. But again, as Tony pointed out, there's a lot of talking about things and that can yield insight. But in the same way that insight doesn't always bring about change in the therapy room, insight doesn't always yield change in actual therapeutic behaviors. And so really making it more specific, more targeted, more fine-tuned is a really crucial thing because it helps the trainee identify specific things, practice them, and do it over and over again. Eli, can I jump in for a second? Because we meet a lot of supervisors, particularly supervisors from the MFT world, who are like, oh yeah, I'm doing deliberate practice every time I meet with my supervisees. And there's a few trends we find that were most, in fact, almost all the supervisors we meet, when you actually watch videos of what they're doing in supervision, do, do, does not qualify as deliberate practice. Now, they, de they are often doing role plays and they're often watching video, which is great. It's a lot better than not doing those things. However, if you look at the role plays, they're often open-ended role plays where they'll just go for three or five or 10 minutes and it'll just be like an open-ended therapy session. And, you know, that's like interesting and that can't be valuable, but what it lacks is the opportunity for the trainee to repeatedly rehearse the same skill or even a micro skill. Now, if you think about it in a soccer terms, it's almost like a soccer scrimmage where you're playing a mock soccer game or match. And that's valuable, but the real deliberate practice is when you practice the same soccer move or play again and again, that is how it moves into what's called state dependent memory, right? Or your muscle memory so that you're, it can almost happen automatically. And this is really important for therapy because therapists, as many 
therapists know and all supervisors know, a lot of times as therapists, we have to operate while we are emotionally activated. We're helping clients who can be very anxious, angry, depressed, whatever it is. And we feel some of that because we're attuned to them like we're supposed to be. And while we're emotionally activated, it can be particularly hard to access skills unless they're in our muscle memory, unless they've been encoded using state-dependent learning. And so that's why it's actually really important to repeatedly rehearse the same skill. So that's one, one way it's different. The other way is a lot of the role plays we say we see in supervision videos, the role play is too hard or too easy. They're asking another trainee to role play the client and the trainees will often veer towards role playing themselves unless there's some kind of script for them to follow. And it, it's just, it's just not a suitable, again, if you think about soccer or piano, your coach is setting you up with exercises that are very precisely targeted in how difficult they are. They're not just like randomly pulling a song, Beethoven's whatever son sonata and saying, play this and you'll get better. And so deliberate practice should be very targeted. And then finally, something we consistently find is we have supervisors who are like, oh yeah, I do a lot of rehearsal. But when you watch the video, they're talking about it, they're not doing it. it. What's fascinating, Eli, is we still see that in our own videos, is we watch videos of ourselves doing deliberate practice. And one of the most consistent findings is that we end up just yakking about therapy instead of actually rehearsing it. We say gravity is always pulling us away from rehearsal. And so unless there's a lot of discipline around a deliberate practice, it just almost inevitably reverts to traditional supervision. So many things to say about what you gentlemen have been commenting on. I guess the first thing, going back to how this is done. So you, Tony, you were saying in the setup at Sentio, everybody gets 25 minutes. So you're doing this in group. Is everybody, if we're drilling the same scenario or skill, so let's give an example, let's just say we're working on reframing goals that work for the entire system, especially if traditionally, I'll give you an example, a husband and wife come in and the husband wants more sex and the wife is not going to give that until she feels more emotionally connected. A skilled therapist kind of has to take two disparate goals and tie them under one banner, like in this example. They both want increased intimacy, one physical intimacy, one emotional intimacy, but you need both. So how a therapist takes disparate goals and tries to frame it into an overarching framework that works the dyad or the couple in this case. If we were working on a skill like that, would everybody in the group be working on that? Or would you be working on, if you have a four person group supervision, would everybody be working on a different skill? So we do both formats where we have a group training and we'll typically start with a very brief lecture describing the skill and then a demonstration where the supervisor or professor will demonstrate the skill with a trainee and like a few times providing feedback. And then we'll split people into pairs and we'll then be rotating around the room providing feedback to the pairs. So that's the group model. There's also the individual supervision model, or you can do it in triadic model, where the supervisor meets with the individual supervisee, and that then you can really customize the practice based on their video and dig deeper and deeper into their video because you're not really attending to the whole group. Yeah, I love it. And something else you are saying makes me think, I have this belief for the last two decades training MFTs that there would be more relational therapy being done, i.e. couple and family therapy, if therapists in training can regulate their own anxiety. I believe that a lot of times we unnaturally contract a system because an example, oh, we have this high conflictual couple. So, hey, here's my colleague. You see the husband, I see the wife. When really, if we could drill more of these scenarios and regulate our own anxiety, the work to be done is relational. So this is where these deliberate practice skills, especially for couple and family therapists, come in really handy. Ryan, I am curious what you think are the, you named some earlier, what do you think are the biggest ones that you see young therapists that are seeing couples and families have anxiety with in these heightened states of, as Tony was talking about, that, that need work on? I have some students right now who are just in their first semester of seeing clients and I'm having them 
do a deliberate practice exercise from the book each week with each other. And the ones that I'm getting some feedback on, they're not all the way through, but it seemed like they were having a little bit more of a difficult time with reframing for some reason, maybe even depending on their general approach and the models that they're starting to try on. Reframing was a little bit hard. A lot of them, for whatever reason, they practice de-escalation in their pre-practicum class, but at some point they usually say, I need some more practice. I need to do more with it. And so I think the de-escalation was really helpful for them. I know systemic questions sometimes too, when you think about the nature of questions and how they can be reflexive or systemic or however they might be, I, beginning therapists struggle a little bit with kind of that additional depth in asking questions. We're really good at asking questions in terms of facts and details, but not always perspective taking questions and things that really can enhance the experience of the clients and our understanding is there. Yeah, I love that because I think a good circular question, as you're mentioning, Ryan, opens up the process asked the right way. If I ask the husband why he ignores his wife, it's very different than asking the wife or if I have a child in the room, what they think of that scenario. So it opens up a process and creates a spontaneous enactment. You're right. Beginning therapists ask a lot of linear questions or yes, no questions that, that shut down the process. So practicing that one early on, I think is essential. So you guys mentioned feedback. So you get feedback from your supervisor and when you break them into pairs, Tony, it sounds like you get feedback from your partner you're working with too. What types of feedback should we look for in these deliberate practice skill building sessions? There's a whole art to giving feedback, and we actually focus on this a lot in our supervision residency. And one of the more surprising things we found with feedback is that that critical feedback, now critical meaning corrective feedback, when done respectfully, actually lowers the trainee's anxiety. Now, this is contrary to what we expected, where it's like, we thought praise would lower their anxiety. And we found that most of our supervisors actually default to giving positive feedback. The, the kind of default to like, oh, you did that great. Let's try it again. That was really good. But what we notice is the more positive feedback the supervisor gives off and the trainee's anxiety keeps going higher and higher until they start giving critical feedback. And it makes sense when you think about it. The trainees know that in most situations, they could be doing better with their clients. Like they want to get better. If you talk to most trainees or tell me what to do, tell me how I can be better. And when they start getting the critical feedback, presuming it's done respectfully, they start to feel reassured. They're like, oh, I can get this. And then they get to rehearse. Now I want to really emphasize something that the feedback only helps if the trainee gets to immediately try the rehearsal again. All right. If you were learning baseball and you swung the bat and you missed the ball and the coach was like, oh, you missed the ball because you swung the bat too fast. Okay, let's go do some catching practice. That would help you zero. You have to swing again and then again and again until you get that skill into muscle memory. And we found it often takes 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes to do that, depending on how emotionally activated the train is. As you were saying, Eli, it's a big issue learning to perform these skills while you're emotionally activated. And we all know no clients will get you as emotionally activated as a high conflict couple. Boom. Those feelings go right into the stratosphere. So we'd say corrective feedback, but really it's important to then give an opportunity to rehearse again. If I'm the supervisor, am I giving corrective feedback after every single rehearsal, Tony? Yeah, ideally. You might get into a situation after a little while where the trainee is, gets it and is doing it well. And then we enter what's called a consolidation phase where you want to let them continue, let them validate that skill, and you just kind of let them do it again and again. Now, you have an interesting choice point right there as a supervisor about whether to make this skill or rehearsal more difficult. 
And that really depends on the trainee. We don't want to flood the trainees too much. But if they pick up the skill pretty quickly, we might increase the difficulty of the stimulus. So the role play or a different spot in the video that they find more challenging. One thing that's interesting that I know I've talked with Tony about is just the nature of feedback in general. And we have a tendency to maybe practice and then have the feedback take five, 10 times longer than the actual practice did. And one of the things that I know that is really valuable in this deliberate practice process is making the feedback as targeted as possible and then quickly allowing them to practice it again and again. The feedback's great, but again, sometimes we pontificate about different thoughts or ideas related to the skill or anything that way. And a lot of times when you're practicing, especially these micro skills, the focus needs to stay on the practice of the skill rather than all of the explanation. And you just focus on what's most needed and then get them back in the practice. The default position for supervision is the supervisor is going on about something that sounds very deep and interesting and important. Maybe it's theory, maybe it's their own clinical experience, maybe it's whatever it is. And the supervisee is sitting there nodding their head and listening. If you just randomly walk into any given supervision anywhere around the world, that's what you're going to see. That research suggests that is limited in effectiveness at best in terms of improving trainee skills. But that is what feels the best for both the supervisor and the supervisee. The supervisor gets to feel important and like they're being listened to and they're sharing their very valuable knowledge with the next generation, yada. And the trainee gets to feel like, oh, I'm hearing all this super important stuff. And they have this image in their mind of them somehow integrating all this and using it with their client. I, I would say that's about as close as me going to a lecture by a world-class violinist on how to play the violin. And I could sit there and listen and nod my head for an hour. Then you put a violin in my hand, you're going to find out very quickly how much of that I actually internalized as a skill. MFT has a rich culture for how we do supervision, as I've been alluding to in many disciplines. If you're a licensed professional for so long, you can have the credential supervisor. AMFT tightly controls the AMFT approved supervisor credential, and you have to have your supervision supervise, so to speak, for a number of times. And I think probably in the same parallel process, good deliberate practice supervision, those supervisors probably need feedback, as you guys have been saying, that they're not pontificating or talking, they're actually focusing on the doings. How do you provide training, Tony, to the actual supervisors to do this better? We have a supervision residency where we start with a few weeks of intensive training. And this is my uh, colleague, Alexandre Vaz's group. And then they get paired up with a few of our trainees and they do video-based supervision. Now, crucially, every supervision session is automatically videotaped, everyone. And we meet weekly with them and review the videos of supervision. So this is not videos of the therapy. This is videos of the supervision. And we go through what they could be doing better. And there is always something we can be doing better as a supervisor. It often has to do with more rehearsal or better rehearsal or staying within the zone of proximal development or giving better feedback or somehow managing the alliance through all this. Now, of course, we're doing this with beginning trainees. So they are also constantly coming up with questions you know, about, oh, what if my client's suicidal? What about my notes? What about my grad practicum? which is all the various questions that supervisors have to deal with. And so it's actually very challenging to get 25 minutes of rehearsal and in the context of everything else. You're also dealing with case conceptualizations and all the other stuff. And we found that it takes weekly soup of soup to, to help supervisors learn how to do that. We find that after about six months, they're generally pretty good at it. And then we start working on edge cases, more particular challenges in, in deliberate practice. 
So a good portion of our listenership are educators, systemic therapy supervisors, and trainees. But we also, especially throughout our five seasons, have picked up a lot of traction with experienced therapists that are out in the field, maybe in private or group practice. So if I'm listening to this, and I'm one of those people, so I'm far removed from my training institution, and I'm not a supervisor. How can deliberate practice help me, a frontline clinician who has been out in the field for some time? When we started this book series, we just, ostensibly it's designed for trainees in graduate school, but we also made sure that it's appropriate for professionals who are licensed and engaged in professional development. Now, if you look at the, the systemic family therapy book, you'll see that the exercises are broken into three levels of difficulty. There's beginner, there's intermediate and advanced. And licensed professionals might have a relatively easy time with the beginning level exercises, but as it moves into the intermediate and advanced, you know, they're going to have a harder and harder time. And even within each exercise, there's different difficulty levels. I you know, really the trick to doing deliberate practice for professional development is to make sure you're finding exercises, skills that are in your personal zone of proximal development. So just beyond your current ability. And I would say, I would just encourage, I think data helps, whether that be your video data, which is really crucial, can form treatment, can be really valuable in getting scores in terms of outcome in terms of alliance, those sorts of things, and being able to look for patterns and gain additional understanding in how long are my clients typically staying in therapy? How often do they drop out? What's my alliance doing over the course of therapy? I think data is your friend if you want to improve video data, self-report data, all of those things help therapists identify areas for improvement. This series, which I want you to talk about, Tony, uh, from APA, uh, including, again, the most recent is Deliberate Practice and Systemic Family Therapy, which we're talking about today, which is our audience. But I have looked at a couple of the other books, specifically Deliberate Practice in CBT, Deliberate Practice in EFT, in... DBT, things that maybe I have not had as much training in, but certainly I use with clients. So another way is if I'm an experienced clinician, but I don't know about a different modality or model, it can really help with that too. So it's not just if you're interested in systemic family therapy, you can go through the whole series, but I think it works that way too. If you're an experienced clinician, but you're trying to learn more about something that is not what you were originally trained in to increase your scope of competence, so to speak. We've got books on, I think there's seven models are out currently, and there's a, about another seven in the pipeline. One of the kind of fun things about using the books is you're not just learning the theory of the model, you're, you get to really get your hands dirty and you get to try it out. For example, for the DBT book, you go through the exercises and you can do the exercises solo. You can do them with a partner. You'll get better feedback if you're doing with a partner or supervisor, but you can do them solo. And a lot of the sample, a lot of the scripted role plays have to do with clients that are suicidal. And especially for a therapist who's not used to working with suicidal clients, it's interesting. You're doing a scripted role play, so you would think that it wouldn't cause emotional activation. But what we hear again and again is that people feel it. They very quickly picture themselves working with a suicidal client and they get to do some of that state dependent learning. And so they get to try it out. It's like with the systemic family therapy exercises, you get to feel a bit of what's it going to be like with more than one client in the room. So someone who's coming from a non-systemic background, who's like, okay, I want to try this. They get to taste that and they get a bit of a good taste of like, okay, this is going to be a little more complicated handling multiple people, there's going to be different levels of emotional activation and that kind of thing. And so it's more of a kind of a hands-on way of doing professional development as opposed to often the, the CEU system can kind of trend towards just kind of a more theoretical knowledge-based learning. Kind of the difference between that you guys write about in the book, declarative knowledge versus procedural knowledge. Yeah, exactly. 
couple more questions before we wrap up. Now, a lot of times we'll get asked, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to practice these skills. I'm going to get more comfortable. I'm going to get immediate feedback, then a chance to do it again. But how do I define expert performance in this case in systemic therapy? How, how do I know I've hit that bar? Sure. It's an interesting question to think about, especially in the books. One really nice thing is there are skill criteria that are identified two or three for each skill or micro skill. And then it's really a lot easier for the trainees to get feedback and even for the supervisor or whoever is giving the feedback to be able to look and say, did they meet the skill criteria for Alliance or for a lot of them? One of the first skill criteria is providing some sort of empathic statement. And for the books, the it's defined and it's really useful that way. If you are a more experienced therapist and you're not using the books, I guess, again, the data can be helpful in terms of helping. If I can see that my outcomes are improving, that is one way. But I think a huge piece is that a lot of deliberate practice is done with a coach, with someone there to guide. So it could be a peer, it could be whomever that can really help identify those areas where, you know, you're doing well or that you can work on improving. Yeah. I would underline what Ryan said, where there's two kind of different perspectives on expertise. There's the, uh, the competence model of expertise, which is, are you performing the model of therapy? In which case you have a supervisor or a coach providing you the feedback, but then there's also the client results model of expertise, which is it helping the client? And you only get that by having the actual therapy session, performing the skill with the client, getting a video and reviewing the video. And ideally the two are working in tandem. They're not separated. One is informing the other. We set goals and help our clients set goals all the time. And sometimes a client has a great goal, but it's too big and we help them collaborate, break it down into something more manageable, a parallel process. How does a good supervisor or clinical trainer help the trainee set appropriate goals around their deliberate practice? I could mention a few things. Sometimes setting goals can be really difficult. And I think one of the reasons why that is, is that they're not like measurable and they're really hard to quantify of, did we accomplish our goal? And so I think with deliberate practice goals, you definitely need to make them measurable. And then again, having that additional person that can help you verify whether you've accomplished those goals, I think is really, really crucial. Yeah. We spend a lot of time on this at the, in the Sentio Deliberate Practice Supervision Residency. And it's, a, it's tricky because we try to have a collaborative model of supervision. You sometimes end up with trainees, especially beginning trainees that are just simply not aware of their skill deficit. And a classic example is a client might make some offhanded comment about self-harm or suicide and the trainee does not follow up and does not do a risk assessment. And the trainee might be like, oh, no, I want to help the client with their boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. And it's like, no, we actually got to spend some time rehearsing risk assessment skills. This is where the video is really valuable because you really get to see what's actually going on in the session. And each supervisor has to improvise this session by session, how collaborative to be and how to directive to be. And this is where it's really important to have a really strong supervisory working alliance. So the trainee will listen to and have some trust in the supervisor's direct. And it does bring me back to this idea of you would think it would be easy to identify all the skills that we use as therapists or as systemic therapists, but it's really a fascinating question to me. And we identify 10 skills, but there are potentially hundreds of skills that would be helpful for supervisors and even clinicians to be able to identify so they can break things down into 
manageable, measurable goals. Yeah. Can I add something to that as well, Eli, is one of the most common concerns or points of pushback on deliberate practice that I hear from supervisors and therapists is, oh, it's going to turn me into a robot or it's going to turn our trainees into a robot. They're just going to be rehearsing these skills and then just memorizing lines and repeating them. And that is the exact opposite. What In rehearsal, we're giving trainees the opportunity opportunity to improvise, to try out different responses, because there isn't a real client in front of them. And because they're doing it repeatedly, they get to really explore their own style and find a style of therapy that will really work for them. And what we find is even though there are defined skills in psychotherapy, therapy is such an art. It's so subtle. It's so nuanced. It's always improvised that almost... In reality, every skill is almost unique to each trainee. We can categorize them, but in a way, each trainee is always practicing a unique skill just for them. Even something like empathy is really going to look different. If you have 10 different trainees, it's really going to look and sound different from each of them. And the repeated rehearsal is actually what lets them find their own skills rather than just imitate whatever they think they should be doing. You mentioned music as a parallel in the beginning and former guest of the show, Michelle Wiener Davis said, I think a quote that encapsulates what you're saying. Once you know the notes, then you can play with feeling. And I think we learn the notes and then we customize the skill to our unique way of being or way of working. So I think that's a beautiful way to end things here. This has been a wonderful talk, gentlemen. Uh, this book, I have used with beginning trainees, as Ryan was talking about, and advanced students a couple months away from graduation revisiting and goal setting around it. So I can't say enough about it. It fits nicely, again, with these common factors that tie us together as relational healers, as systemic therapists. I want to give you a chance to, again, plug the book and please talk about the program at Sentio, Tony, and how people can find out more and how people can contact you guys. Definitely, they can reach me at ryan.cdall, two E's, two L's, usu.edu. And the listeners can reach me at the Sentio Counseling Center website, that, that's s-e-n-t-i-o-c-c.org. And that's where we also have more information about the, we do webinars and workshops on the books in the series. And where we have our deliberate practice supervision residency, we actually are running two cohorts a year. So people can look that up. And one thing I would request is if any of the listeners are using deliberate practice, please drop us an email and let us know what works, what doesn't work, how are you using it? We're, ga- we're gradually collecting all this information because this is relatively new for the field and we want to explore all together how it's working. Eli, back with you, bringing to close another successful installment of the MFT podcast. Thank you, Tony and Ryan. Great talk. And again, I use the book with my advanced and beginning MFT students, Deliberate Practice in Systemic Family Therapy from APA Books, as you can find out everything you need to about the collection of books from APA at drtonyr.com, the collection of books in addition to Deliberate Practice for Psychotherapists, which came first. Another great book that talks about Deliberate Practice, the Cycle of Excellence that Tony wrote along with people like Scott Miller and Bruce Wampold. You can find these Deliberate Practice series around child and adolescent psychotherapy, emotionally focused therapy, motivational interviewing, multicultural therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy. So even if you're a listener to this and you're like, I'm a MFT true and true, and I have these skills that we've been talking about, but I actually want to extend the scope of my competence in other areas. They all follow a similar form with really skills that you can practice and get feedback on. As a psychotherapy trainer and educator, I think they really work well in an educational setting, but also if you're improving your work once you've left graduate school and you've already licensed. So if you're interested in some of the things we talked about, the common factors of MFT, in addition to the book by Ryan, Tony, Alexandra Vaz, 
and Deb Miller, Systemic Family Therapy, Miller Practice. You can check out my book with my colleague, Adrian Blow, President-Elect of AMFT, also a gentleman and a scholar. Our book, Bringing Common Factors to Life in Couple and Family Therapy by Rutledge Books. A great combo to use with what we were talking about today. We'd love to listen to you. Get your feedback. That informs what we do on the AMFT podcast. You can get a hold of me, Eli, at NorthStarCounselingCenter.com. I'm at EliCaram.com. That's E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M.com. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Eli Live, and the AMFT is at the AAMFT. Thank you for listening. Until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay systemic.